Jamie Rhodes is the assistant director of the Feed the Future Peanut Innovation Lab at the University of Georgia. The lab coordinates research coordination between the U.S. and developing countries um, research partners, primarily in Africa, with a focus on variety development, value-added grains, nutrition, and gender and youth. Prior to this position, Jamie worked as a value chain consultant and agriculture development professional, primarily in Haiti, with Meds and Food for Kids a nonprofit producer of ready-to-use therapeutic food. His focus was on proving the peanut value chain to supply raw materials to the factory, particularly related to the control of aflatoxin contamination. Last night, I gave somebody a ride that's from the north of Haiti, and I mentioned Jamie was speaking, and he's like, that factory's still working. Good job, Jamie. <laughs> Prior to focusing on peanuts, he worked with the reforestation project CODEP, located near Leogon, Haiti, and continues to serve on their board. He holds an MS in natural resources from Cornell University and a BA in anthropology and sustainable development from Appalachian State University. I've known Jamie for some time as we both started in international development about the same time. I appreciate seeing how his experience in rural Haiti has continued to influence the important research that the Peanut Lab is doing and influencing the applied research he is supporting through the lab. I've at various times in my life came to Jamie for advice. So I just want to publicly apologize to Jamie. Um, he once gave me advice on graduate schools to attend. And after hearing Aaron McGuire from UC Davis share yesterday, I now agree I probably should have gone to UC Davis instead of Cornell. <laughs> but sorry, Jamie, I didn't take your advice on that. <laughs> but I do want to thank you for still being willing to come and share um, the work that you're doing. Join me in welcoming you. here. Um, as uh, Brian was saying, I've heard about ECHO for like 20 years because I started as uh, an intern with CODEP back and I went there in high school and CODEP was really involved with uh, ECHO a long time ago and as an intern there we learned a lot of techniques. I used the ECHO resources and it's always been a kind of a touchstone to come back to but I've never been able to come to the conference so when Brian and I were talking about this it was like, yes, finally I get to come. So. Um, I've learned a lot already this week and made lots and lots of good connections and it's, it's, it's really, um, it's been fun. I will apologize as well right up and say um, I can geek out on peanuts for a long time but I was assured yesterday that this audience would actually appreciate people that geek out on agriculture so um, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, first and foremost, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself because I have the microphone and I can. Um, second, I'm going to talk about peanuts, partially because we got a really good sales pitch yesterday about breadfruit, and uh, I'm going to try to follow up the best I can. I'm a, I'm a believer, having lived in Haiti, I, I love breadfruit. Um, I'm going to talk about aflatoxin because I have to. <laughs> And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about our lab and the research that we do, um, all the pieces of it, and, um, and then really kind of come back to this example in Haiti of what we were doing with, uh, with MFK and how we were able to supply peanuts into that, uh, into that factory that, yes, indeed, is still running and has supplied exported peanut products to 15 countries now. So that's a, uh, quite an example. And then I wanted to finish up with some practical information about peanuts because I think in this audience there's a lot of people that would like that. And then I had just a few thoughts about kind of uh, bigger issues on the future of peanuts, but also just on small scale agriculture that I would share. And then I doubt there'll be any time, but if there is, I'll answer questions. And then uh, mostly I'm counting on that happening later today. <laughs> um, so first, me. Oh, sorry, one, one back there. I, this picture is me in a field in northern Haiti, and I thought it was very appropriate because I felt like I was standing in the middle of chaos and order, and I still feel like I'm standing there. This was a, a farmer research 
to figure out if, if we were right about planting in rows or if he would just follow the traditional uh, scatter plot planting. And depending on the context, they might, might be better to just go with their scatter plot than in our rows, but we'll see. Um, so as I've said a few times, I started off in CODEP. Um, the, the picture there with the guy kneeling, several people in this room probably know him. That's Jim Getz. If there's a forest in Parc La Visite 20 years from now, it has a lot to do with Jim. But he visited me with, uh, that was last year or a year ago in CODEP. And that's what peanuts look like in Laogon. And I will tell you, as a soil conservation person working in reforestation, I really didn't like peanut farmers at all. They, they do not do any favors to those mountain hillsides around Laogon, and much of Haiti is, as you know, very steep. So it was a little bit strange when I took a job working as a peanut research person at MFK, and I had to convince myself that maybe if we'd focus on intensification in the lowlands and these places like that other picture in uh, northeast Haiti, that we could supply peanuts to the factory. So ready to use therapeutic food, which is the, the picture of these, these young ladies up there, is a fortified peanut butter. If you haven't heard of it, it's used for treating severe acute malnutrition. They make uh, three products there at that factory, actually, for uh, moderate acute malnutrition and also a school snack. Um, but when I took the job, I started to learn something about aflatoxin. I realized this was no uh, simple task to, to just buy peanuts and turn them into this product that we're going to then sell to UNICEF or uh, to highly regulated markets. And aflatoxin was the, the, the big challenge. So um, my job was to interface with guys like these uh, who grow peanuts in huge scale in Georgia and have lots of research uh, capacity. They harvest peanuts in these giant combines, and the reality of Haiti is that's not going to happen. But we can learn a lot from each other, actually, in both directions, I think. And that's where our lab really tries to uh, be the interface between um, dual benefits, in some ways, to both the US research on, on what they can learn from, from Haiti. We've identified some diseases that might be a problem in the future. But then also to kind of work, of course, backwards to figure out what technologies and information that we have in the US might work in, in those contexts. So in the, the bottom picture there is us running lots and lots of randomized control trials on inputs and uh, varieties. Um, that's our, our research uh, station at MFK's factory. And then the other image is, is our uh, miniaturized, I would say, version of a US peanut shelling plant um, built by, by Frank, who was here yesterday with me, and he's here today, and is an excellent research uh, uh, resource for, for people working on peanuts. And, one of the themes that I'll come back to a few times is that peanuts are just different. Uh, machines that work for other crops will not work for peanuts. And you kind of have to work through all that in a pretty unique way, um, which makes challenges, but is, but is also exciting. Um, so why peanuts? Um, I was going to, you know, hey, shout out some words, but then I saw Aaron's presentation yesterday, and I didn't have that app yet, so I, I thought, I'll just jumpstart that, and I'll go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cut in and say the ones that I wanted to hear. And one is I want to go ahead and say peanut allergies do not exist, for the most part, outside of North America, Europe, and Australia. The rest of the world just doesn't have that problem. Why that is could be the hygiene hypothesis. There's probably an early exposure, but... That's a whole other presentation, and I'll just put that to the side, and you can talk about it later if you want. But the rest of the world does not have peanut allergy problems. <laughs> um, there are, this is just quick, quick things that we all know it, and we're talking about the same things. There are four kinds of peanuts. There are Virginia, Runner, Spanish, and Valencia. Those are market types, but there's two botanical types. There's kinds that grow upright, and then there's kinds that grow prostrate on the ground. And the big differences are some of them take 80 days to mature, and some of them take 180 days to mature. So you can imagine that that range is quite different depending on where they're going to fit into your agricultural system. They are an indeterminate crop. But unlike an indeterminate tomato, you only get to harvest them once because you dig them up and kill them, which means you have to really think about maturity, and that makes an additional challenge. Um, we've had two presidents that have grown peanuts. Anyone can probably guess the first one. Jimmy Carter. Thomas Jefferson grew peanuts. Thomas Jefferson grew peanuts because he recognized way back then, maybe not in the same language, but peanuts offer 
you know, you kind of hear about the three-legged stool of sustainability. You've got the environmental, social, and, and uh, economic. And I think he recognized even back then that this has potential in that way. So I'm going to use that sort of three-legged stool analogy and kind of go through those on how peanuts are useful for those. Uh, I think peanuts kind of check all those boxes. Oh, I did want to point out one other thing. A peanut, of course, is, is not a nut. Um, it's more of a bean. Also, if you look closely at that picture, peanuts don't grow on the roots. <laughs> they very strangely flower above ground, and then for some reason, maybe they're shy, they, they then <laughs> stick their heads underground and form those pods underground, which is where they come from. But they, they're not tubers. They don't grow on the roots. Um, and they're much more related to a bean than they are, in fact, a nut. But um, they are, in, in many ways, much healthier than a nut as well. Um, Moving on, the um, incredible nutritional benefits of peanuts. They are, uh, they are really a superfood. Um, maybe you've heard about this tool, the, the, the dual burden that, of malnutrition that we're seeing a lot of developing countries of both undernutrition and you know, overnutrition or hypernutrition of, of obesity and chronic diseases. Peanuts actually work in direct, both directions. Uh, despite being full of fat, there's lots of evidence that peanuts are very satiating and therefore help you with obesity. So people here, type 2 diabetes, I mean, there's all kinds of, of amazing benefits of consuming more peanuts. Children who eat peanuts are, more, are less likely to be malnourished. Mothers who consume peanuts are, have healthier babies. Um, there's lots and lots of evidence of this. And even if you're chronic uh, eating peanuts regularly, there's evidence that you can reduce dementia, Alzheimer's disease, um, they were part of, someone mentioned the Harvard Healthy Plate study the other. Peanuts are, are uh, part of that study because they found that they just fit into so many healthy diets. Um, and in fact, they have just been designated a superfood, whatever that actually means. And the Peanut Institute uh, has been promoting it. I don't think peanuts are going to replace quinoa or teff as kind of the next, like, sell it out kind of thing around here. Maybe, maybe breadfruit. Um, but if you're interested in health benefits of peanuts, the Peanut Institute, which is in Albany, Georgia, is an excellent resource. They, they, yes, they are an industry-funded uh, group, but they, they really do some excellent research. Um, the plant is used in so many ways. And I, I think the main thing I wanted to say about this is that um, there are just so many benefits uh, of peanuts. And I just learned that um, in Senegal, I know there's some folks from Senegal that 27% of all households in Senegal grow peanuts, but 52% of people that live in extreme poverty in Senegal grow peanuts, which when I first heard that, I was like, correlation, causation, this is a problem. But in reality, it's because those people live in such difficult environments that they choose to grow peanuts, and peanuts probably keep them healthier than they would be otherwise. And we see that all over the world. And the reason is because they just have so many benefits. Um, on the environment, um, intercropping with peanuts, as you can see, they are actually the, uh, the most water efficient nut. The USDA has been kind of using some more recent data, but again, my sales pitch, I don't have anything against almonds, but uh, less than five gallons per ounce of water is needed to produce an ounce of peanuts. It takes 80 gallons of water to produce an ounce of almonds. That's five, less than a five gallon bucket compared to two bathtubs. So they're extremely water efficient. They're the most water efficient nut. Um, in fact, we have research in Georgia that's showing that if you stress the plant at certain times of the year, you can increase the yield. Amazing. So precision irrigation research is, is really fascinating. Um, peanuts prefer sandy soils that are drought prone and infertile. So they're grown by these places that are, or excuse me, I have to, um, the, the, these are these places like in Senegal that are the poorest households. Um, rotations. I wanted to share this one little tidbit about why peanuts are so important in rotations. Um, who, a, apart from Jimmy Carter and maybe now me, you know, if you think about names of famous people associated with peanuts, <laughs> who's the other one? In, for people in the US in particular. George Washington Carver. Yes, good. Um, Interestingly, George Washington Carver was not a food scientist. 
he was a he was a botanist actually he was the first african american trained in an advanced degree i think at ohio iowa state and he was sent by booker t washington to tuskegee institute as an agronomist to improve soil and when he got there he said man they're planting cotton after cotton after cotton and now we've got the boll weevil what are we going to do we need a legume so then he said oh my goodness what are we going to do with all these peanuts and that's why he started coming up with all these things to do with the peanuts but uh, the reason that we grow peanuts at scale is partially to do with we needed a legume rotation crop in the, in the Deep South. And uh, prior to, to that, peanuts were just a snack food. They kind of spread during the Civil War because of all these good satiating benefits. But it was, it was held as a garden crop and grown mostly by, by slaves and former slaves. So um, anyhow, it's a, it's, a, it's a really fascinating crop that way. Um, on the nutrition side, again, Peanuts are used in so many different ways. We think about peanut butter and snacks and candies, but the majority of the world eats things like mafe and uh, sinjiro. And if you haven't had mafe, you really need to. I mean, I mean, peanut groundnut stew is, is excellent. Um, that's how peanuts are consumed. But the main use of peanuts in the world is peanut oil. The rest of the world's, most of the world's production goes to peanut oil in India and China because it's the highest smoke point of any well, common vegetable oil. It's almost 500, so it's excellent for frying stuff. Um, peanut butter is the number one item requested by food banks, food pantries, because it's cheap, it's shelf stable, so you don't need a refrigerator or anything. It's very filling, it's healthy, and it's delicious, so kids like to eat it. There's, there's a reason that people like peanuts. Um, RUTF, I, I mentioned before, but uh, these are used as the gold standard treatment for, for treating severe acute malnutrition around the world, and the number one ingredient is peanuts for a reason. Um, in much of the Sahel, 25 to 30 percent of the value of the crop is that green stuff that grows above the ground because it has about the same protein content as alfalfa, and it grows in really tough places. So much of the Sahel, they dry that part, and the nuts are, are only like uh, two-thirds of the value, but the rest is, is all above ground. Um, peanut meal, which again, if you're pressing for the oil, is used in poultry feed, and it's very similar to soybean meal, so it's, or in, in hog feed, for example. Uh, fuel, uh, the first diesel uh, engine was run on peanut oil by Rudolf Diesel. Um, so it's, it, it, again, fascinating crop. But Oh, and I also wanted to say, the shells. Everybody asks, what do you do with the shells? Well, in the States, we make all kinds of stuff. You can feed ruminants with it, you can do livestock bedding, we make fire logs, uh, kitty litter, ant bait, but also biochars, um, carbon credits. We used to pelletize them and ship them to Europe and we get carbon credits for it, if you can imagine. But my favorite one, this is just one little tidbit story, and one of our prob uh, collaborators in Haiti that used all of our shells from MFK was soil, if anyone's ever heard. They make human manure composting, household composting. It turns out that peanut uh, shells are very good at absorbing odor, and so it made their household toilets work much, much better. So, um, on, the, on the market side of things, um, peanuts are one of the few crops that I think have both formal and uh, informal trade markets that are very active, and in some places they're extremely high value. I heard last year in Malawi that shelled peanuts were being sold into the DRC at almost $1,000 a ton. That's a lot of money. Um, and that's regional trade, no, no uh, quality controls or anything either. And so, um, the, and it's not like, I thought of two examples of you know, cashews and coffee where you've got to ship it over to export it and sit on your money for months at a time. That's like cash on the barrel head in a lot of countries. Um, peanuts are often thought of as a, as a women's crop. We had several comments of, even this morning about about the role of women in agriculture, but one of the other kind of interesting stories is in West Africa, peanuts are widespread. And a lot of it was with, during the colonial period, they were exporting peanuts for, for oil, vegetable oil. But when we came up with new types of uh, alternative vegetable oils, peanuts kind of faded into the background, but they didn't really. They were just grown by women because they knew all these benefits. And so when you go to Nigeria, which is the largest producer almost as much as the US and Africa, it's almost entirely grown by women. Um, and that has all those positive benefits that we've, we've heard about, about you know, where does the money go? Um, 
but there's a lot of interesting and kind of scary things as we move towards more formal commercialization of peanut crops. Are they going to be, how are women going to be involved? That's one of the, the research problems that are questions that we have in our lab. So, you know, what's the, uh, what's the problem? I mean, like, we've got all these great benefits. Uh, why, why aren't peanuts grown more? Um, the first one is that relative low productivity. My, my friend Donald Chase in Oglethorpe, Georgia, grows over 7,000 pounds an acre last year, which is enormous. I mean, that's great. That, granted, that was the state average, over 500 acres. But we're about a tenth of that in Haiti with our advanced farmers getting about 700 pounds. And that's, that's about what the rest of the world is doing. It's the average in the world is less than a, less than a ton of, uh, an acre, or less than 1,000 pounds an acre. So. There's some real challenges to increase that productivity. Um, but it's also, I, I see it as an opportunity that we can, we can close that yield gap. Uh, there are ways to do it. But unfortunately, there are no, there are no easy wins. I, I joke with some of the people that there's no sort of urea on a hybrid fertilizer kind of uh, approach that you, for better or for worse, that you can just you know, put something on there and get a yield gain. Um, we've done a lot of input trials. Um, and it doesn't, it's just, it's difficult. It's also peanuts, even though they're everywhere, grown in well over 100 countries, everywhere their varieties are a little different. People like different colors, different oil contexts. And so it's very sort of local specific. There's also a lot of very local specific diseases that make it a challenge. You can't take a peanut variety from Georgia that produces seven tons and take it to Malawi and think that it's gonna grow at all, practically. Um, uh, on the diseases, it, there are a lot of foliar diseases. There's a few viruses that are very scary that can wipe things out in Africa. There's groundnut, mostly in East Africa, groundnut rosette virus that's really similar to a virus that we have in the United States, and we're not even sure why it hasn't moved yet. Um, it's vectored by a different disease, but that can wipe out your crop if you're not growing a resistant variety. Um, and then, of course, aflatoxin. Oh, my friend. Um, Aflatoxins, if you're not familiar, are secondary metabolites of a very common tropical uh, soil-borne fungus called Aspergillus flavus. That's where the name comes from, Aspergillus flavus toxin. Um, it's ubiquitous in the world. We probably will be breathing spores of A. flavus when we go out to the farm later today. Um, we have a major aflatoxin problem in the U.S. Uh, we spend a lot of money controlling it. Um, it's very difficult to detect, and it's a serious problem. So let me talk a little bit more about aflatoxin. Um, in terms of human health, the main thing is that it's, it's a carcinogen. It's a heptocarcinogen, so it causes liver cancer when you eat it regularly. Um, and when you combine it with hepatitis, you get serious problems. In some countries, uh, liver cancer accounts for about 10% of all deaths. Um, and it's probably because of hepatitis combined with eating lots of contaminated maize. Um, Aflatoxicosis is a thing. You can eat and die from aflatoxicosis. In 20, 2004, in Kenya, they had 317 confirmed deaths because people didn't have anything else to eat but contaminated corn. Um, terrible tragedy, but the big thing is the chronic exposure. Um, and that leads, again, to the correlation causation question, in some cases, about stunting. Um, I always kind of frame it this way, and I know there's nutritionists that know more about this than me. Um, the Lancet did a study where they kind of said, we know about a third of malnutrition is macronutrient deficiencies. We know another third is micronutrient deficiencies. And then we have this kind of unknown third that probably has something to do with malabsorption and you know, environmental enteropathy, diarrheal disease. And that's where aflatoxin fits in. We think it causes gut problems. There's a lot of evidence if you feed it to livestock you definitely get stunting in your chickens, for example. Um, so you don't want kids to be eating this stuff, at large amounts in particular. Um, I will say that aflatoxin is not just a peanut problem. It's in lots and lots of crops. And from a public health standpoint, it's probably more of a maize problem. Um, the lower concentrations, but also you're eating a lot more maize. But dried cassava, dried chilies, even sorghum, um, any dried products. I think Aaron mentioned in the horticulture lab, they're looking at it, but chilies as a, but the, the big problem is local trade is one issue, 
people don't really know that much about it, so it's not really a problem, but it is increasing. And a lot of countries are starting to put regulatory limits, but testing and power enforcement is, is difficult. But the big one is on the export. So a lot of countries, in, in Africa in particular, used to export to the EU. And when they put the regulatory limit at 4 ppb, which is, I mean, it is right at the level of detection with sampling error, it made it almost impossible for them to export their peanuts. And there's numbers from IFPRI saying you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in lost trade um, to protect um, European consumers. Um, but as I said, you know, we have a regulatory limit of 15 ppb in the US, and we estimate $300 million is either spent or lost every year, some years worse than others, in controlling aflatoxin right here in the US. Um, so what do we do about it? All right, now what's the answer? And in reality, of course, is that that's a trick question because it's not one thing. It's the whole system of things that we have to do to control aflatoxin. Um, I talked about this with several people yesterday, but um, it turns out that you know healthy plants have healthy immune systems and can resist aflatoxin. And A. flavus is a really weird mold that you think of molds and you think of wet, humid, but A. flavus really likes it hot and dry. They are the opportunist mold that grows when everything else doesn't. Um, and so your plant is already having uh, is already stressed out because of drought and then it infects the plant. Um, so whatever we can do to have healthier plants, uh, good soil fertility, rotations, all those things can help uh, to some degree. Um, the pictures are a little bit out of order, but the on-time harvest, the single thing that farmers can do is plant early and harvest on time. That's not always easy because you got a lot going on when you're trying to plant and a lot going on when you're trying to harvest, but we have really solid data that says if you plant early and catch the best of the rainy season and not let it go way past into when the, rainy, when the rains are done, you can eliminate a huge part of the problem with aflatoxin. That's if you have a fairly predictable rainy season. <laughs> um, if you're in a bimodal rainy season, you got another problem that you dig your peanuts and then you get rained on. Um, but drying is the other one, is, is get the peanuts out of the ground, off the plant, and dried as fast as possible, and sort out all the funky ones before you put them in storage. And if you do those things, put them in good storage, good dry, you know, well ventilated, you can eliminate probably 80 to 90% of the problem. Um, you're not going to be able to export to the EU, but from a public health perspective, I think it's a lot safer to eat peanuts that are, that are treated uh, that way. Um, on the storage side of things, uh, we, we saw PIX bags yesterday. I think there's a lot of future in hermetic storage. Peanuts are a little bit weird, again, that they don't quite work because of the high oil content. We've got some conflicting data, but we've also had really good results using PIX bags for peanuts to kill insects and, and reduce aflatoxin uh, or, or keep it from growing. Um, I did want to say one thing is that you can't roast out aflatoxin. You can kill the bio stuff, you know, salmonella when you roast, but the melting point of aflatoxin is like 600 degrees, so you wouldn't have much left to eat if you, if you did it. Um, the other thing that you can do with peanuts anyways is that you can press for oil, which is why the rest of the world eats so much peanut oil. Uh, if you press for the oil and you have clarified oil, the, pro it, uh, the aflatoxin is bound to the protein, so it stays with the cake. So you have, that's what we do with it in the States, that's what we do in West Africa, um, and that's what we probably need to do when we're sorting out all those grade outs. And since you guys live in a lot of places where they eat peanuts, I, I will say this, I still eat lots of peanut products when I travel. I try to do it with some awareness around this, but things that are like really cheap peanut butter, um, coolie coolie if you're in West Africa, um, kebab powder, which I love, but um, that's where all the grayed out peanuts go. So that's where all the concentrated aflatoxin is. Um, I, this is a serious public health issue that we need to do something because it ends up being that the poor people get the worst food. And this happens over and over again, but it's really exacerbated in peanuts. And so we're looking at some solutions where you can treat maybe to reduce or, or degrade the aflatoxin, but it's a, it's a serious problem. Um, if anyone is familiar with the word aflasafe, anyone? Okay, 
maybe come and talk to me later. That's a complex topic. So <laughs> Aflisafe is a biocontrol product, but it's a whole other presentation. So we can talk about that later. If you're in Senegal or Nigeria, I'm trying to remember where they have it out, um, Kenya, Tanzania, come and talk to me. Um, we do have these infographics uh, available on our webpage in lots and lots of languages on how to control aflatoxin, some basics. So please go find them. If you want them translated, we can, and I, I, I've talked with some folks here at ECHO about getting them on the ECHO community as well. Um, so I'm gonna transition a little bit and talk about the lab. I could talk about the lab for a long time, but um, we've had a, a lot of interesting connections with the innovation labs. Uh, Aaron was here talking about the horticulture innovation lab. Um, I think there's a, a, an opportunity for the ECHO community to connect a lot more with the innovation labs. There's 23 of them. They're funded by the Bureau of Food Security at USAID. So there's challenges with working with the federal government, of course, and universities too. But um, uh, there's, there's a lot of good research and applied research out there that's, that's uh, a, a good network to, to connect with. Um, the peanut lab has been at UGA since the beginning of these labs, so the early 80s. It used to be called the peanut crisp, or if you've ever heard of, it used to be the bean cowpea crisp or the insor meal crisp. That's the same uh, sort of evolution of these labs. There's, uh, I think, 23 labs right now. They work on all kinds of stuff, fish and uh, technology, food processing, post-harvest loss. Um, anyways, we're in the second year of our uh, five-year phase, so we're just kind of set up all of our projects and out and running, and it's, you know, it's an exciting time for us. These are our startup projects uh, meetings we, we, in Uganda, Senegal, uh, and Malau. Uh, anyways, we we're in four countries. I'll show you our, this is our airline map of where we're working. Um, we work with 10 universities, uh, mostly land-grant universities. And our overseas partners are usually like the National Ag Research Services or the, the NARS, kind of their equivalents of, the, of USDA or universities. Sometimes it's NGOs. Um, our four target countries um, are Senegal, Ghana, Uganda, and Malawi. So that's where we're mostly working, but we have lots of ties historically in other places as well. And uh, Brian was saying some of the things that we're working on, variety development, um, I can talk about this a lot, but uh, it's you know high-end science. Everything from you know we just published the the peanut genome. What, the lead author that's David Bertioli is at UGA. He's a really interesting guy and does um, a lot of work on wild species introgression. So when you go out to Echo later today, you're going to walk around on perennial peanuts. Um, perennial peanuts are a distant relative to peanuts, but there's about 50 species out there that are identified and been collected. And the really interesting thing about peanuts is that peanuts are a tetraploid, meaning they have four sets of uh, chromosomes, but all the other ones are diploids. That weird crossing happened, and we know this now because of all this genetic work, that happened one time in nature about 10,000 years ago in South America. And that means that we have a really narrow genetic diversity of that crop. Even though it's all over the world and we seem to have this diversity, there's really not a lot of diversity to find traits for resistance or disease or drought tolerance. And so one of the things that we're doing is figuring out how to bring traits from those wild species into the cultivated peanuts. And we've actually found with these new genetic tools that we're using that some of that's already happened because they've been doing these crosses since back in the 70s. And they've made their way around in some of the most popular varieties in Africa have wild species introgressions that brought that disease resistance. And we didn't even know that until we kind of found these genetic tools to figure out where those genes were, were moving around with just uh, seed trade. Um, one of the other sort of tidbit stories that I, I always like to tell people, and we'll bring it back to Haiti a little bit, was that peanuts are from the southern cone, kind of where Paraguay, Bolivia, Argentina come together, um, and they were taken around the world during the sort of age of exploration, colonialism, um, by the Spanish, which is why we have Spanish variety, Valencia peanuts. They don't grow peanuts in Spain, to the best of my knowledge, except maybe a few. Um, and then, so they were taken to Africa and Asia, and then brought back to the US via the slave trade by by African slaves, and then maintained in, in the U.S. by African slaves. 
and then that commercialization around George Washington Carver. So it's, it's just a really interesting thing, but one little tidbit, the first European interaction with peanuts happened in Haiti, in Hispaniola. So Bartolome de las Casas, if you remember his name from school, reported about eating, eating these little nuts in Haiti, and it turns out those were, were peanuts. So they were brought by the indigenous people all the way up through the Caribbean way back then. Um, anyhow, our, uh, we, we've, also, we've got a, a large network, and I think from a practical standpoint for things that people have interested on varieties. Um, these are all the national program breeders across Africa. We work with about 18 breeders. A lot of these guys are releasing really good varieties. They're not always easy to get the varieties, but reach out to those national programs. They may have something really interesting if you're growing peanuts that have you know, disease resistances and things like that that might be of interest to your, to your missions. Um, we do a lot of work on value chain improvement, uh, in particular things like looking at incentives for aflatoxin. So if you test aflatoxin at the field, can you give someone a market premium? And then how do they react to that premium to, to, to access improved markets? Um, I specifically wanted to talk about one, one project that we're working with on value chains in Senegal. Um, there's a researcher at Ohio State who's been working with the national program there, and they've developed a, a kind of an agroforestry system called the optimized shrub system. Let me get that right. And they use um, two species of shrubs that are, are native across the Sahel, Gera senegalensis and Pileostigma reticulum. Sorry, if someone knows the prediction. But they coppice those shrubs, and they increase the population of them. I think Echo might have had a technical note about this, but we're working with those guys to, um, to look at how that might be improved for the peanut system. Uh, I think that one, if you guys are working in the Sahel, it's a really interesting, um, very interesting from a scientific perspective, but also increasing soil fertility over time. Um, on nutrition, um, we're doing some work on the gut microbiome, alternative uses of peanuts. Um, this, this guy here, Agregama, and uh, on your left, um, developed a peanut drink. I'm hoping that it'll be out in Malawi. It's delicious, and I'm hoping we'll see it here in the States, too. Um, uh, highly nutritious. Um, we, we also work with um, a lot of food safety issues, um, aflatoxin just being one, salmonella, if you've heard about peanuts and salmonella, it's another problem. But um, on gender and youth, we kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier, and women being the, the sort of primary farmers often case of, of peanuts. Every culture, every context is a little bit different, but we're, we're trying to kind of raise awareness around the role of women in science. Uh, Esther is one of these like bright star of genetic research working with us at Macquarie University. Um, looking at women's time, evaluating women's time and where they're using uh, labor-saving implements, for example, and using ethnographic tools to figure out what, what might work, so part of that human-centered design process. Um, so those are our areas where we're working. I want to bring it back to, um, back to Haiti, because there's a lot of people that care about Haiti in this room, but also it's an excellent case of what we were able to achieve when I was there and continuing on. So MFK, this you know, factory, they continue to buy about 60 metric tons. That's not a huge amount, but that's not nothing to shake your, you know. Well, for me, it's, I want it to be more, so I'll shake my fist at it. But um, Excesso, which was, it's a, it's a for-profit uh, sort of benevolent aggregator. They do, uh, they're, they're an offshoot that came from, from MFK. Um, they work in the Central Plateau with about 2,000 growers. And, and, and so if you're buying uh, Rebo or Montu, that's where they're getting their peanuts from. So those peanuts are controlled for aflatoxin now. Um, I won't make any guarantees, but they should be lower than normal. The Partners in Health has a factory, and, and with Excesso are bringing Mambalavi. Apparently, it's a, if anyone is, you know, for those who know Haiti well, uh, if you like Mamba Pimante, it will be available in the U.S. hopefully soon. We'll see. Unfortunately, the current situation has made it a little difficult to get it out. But they have been able to meet consistently U.S. export regulatory standards to be able to bring that. And part of that is having this whole value chain approach. And, um, oh, sorry, that publication is a, is a UGA extension publication of all the research that wouldn't really meet... Um, you know, getting into a peer-reviewed journal, but is really good, solid data. It's available online. We're translating it into French. Um, 
and it should be available soon. But the, the, what, what we've really done is focus on the agronomy, a lot of it on, on improved trials for inputs and varieties, um, but also just basic agronomy, plant spacing, uh, inputs to, or you know, implements to getting peanuts in and out of the ground faster, so technologies, and, and then looking at you know, how do we do field testing and coming up with innovative ways to process peanuts and maintain traceability. Um, and that's really how MFK has been able to uh, uh, source peanuts consistently um, in order to, to sell those products to UNICEF. Um, we've also built a lot of human capacity there. I think we've had 45 master's thesis uh, completed and a couple of MS students working in Canada right now. Um, so it's a, good, it's a good success. And I'm happy to talk about that more later too. Um, Practical thoughts, because I know we're a lot of practical people in this room, and I apologize. The writing ended up a little smaller because I just had too much to say, um, as you can tell. Um, I, I'll go through the list and just kind of quickly. But seeking out, you need local solutions. That's probably across all things, but it just seems that way for peanuts. Like I said, you can't take varieties from Georgia and they and expect them to grow well everywhere. Um, Peanut seed uh, systems are particularly difficult because the multiplication rates are low, the planting rates are high, and peanut seed is pretty fragile, so germination can be lost really quickly. It's a really difficult problem. If you're going to get into peanuts at all, you probably need to be your own seed company, um, which is difficult. But um, the single thing I would encourage people to do that are planting peanuts is to increase peanut planting populations. Uh, we've seen it as good evidence pretty much everywhere that people are underplanting the, plant, the, the density. And that magic number seems to be around 200,000 plants per hectare. So that's 75 centimeters and 6 million <laughs> plants. Um, it varies a little bit depending on variety and location, but that seems to be um, in, in a, kind of a rough number that works. Um, test your soil. Uh, legumes in particular don't do as well in low pH. So adding lime can make a huge difference. Peanuts, the only thing that they actually respond to generally is calcium because they absorb it directly through the pods, um, which is another weird thing about peanuts. But um, lime can be a, a really good friend. Um, but know your source of your calcium because gypsum, by the way, is neutral. And people always get that confused. Um, the other thing that farmers who don't have inputs, you know, weeding. I mean, it's pretty basic, but weed early and often and get those plants to cover because peanuts have a dense canopy and can outcompete weeds only if you give them a chance. Um, and that little microclimate that's there often, uh, we think and we have evidence that it might reduce aflatoxin because it's cooling the soils. Um, pay attention to the diseases, not every case, but in Haiti we found one or two sprays of fungicide really well timed. You get a huge bang for your buck. Um, focus on the rotations because the best way to get increased uh, fertility is probably to fertilize whatever you're planting before peanuts. That's how we do it in the States. So if you're growing it in a maize rotation, you know, the residual fertility will be around for the peanuts. Um, on the aflatoxin, I've said this before, but plant early and harvest on time. Um, we can talk about maturity determination. That's, that's a whole kind of art in itself. That picture right there is a maturity board, which is a technology that seems to transfer pretty well um, to other countries. Get them off the, the plant and get them dried as fast as you can, and then sort them before you store them, and then sort them before you eat them, essentially. Um, and if you're working with people that want to try to sell peanuts to a regulated market, i.e., that has a, an aflatoxin standard, Learn as much as you can about what testing aflatoxin means, because it's really complicated. Um, and I get calls all the time that people say, well, I shipped a container to South Africa, and they tested it, and we tested it here, and, and it was fine. Then they tested it, and it's no good. It's a really complex problem related to sampling error and test methods and all these things. But if you're really interested in that, you know, come and talk to me. Um, look at our web page. We've got some really good resources. Um, and that, you know, all solutions are local. I think that's kind of one of these, you know, we had really good technical outside people. We work with these farmers that grow seven-ton peanuts, but those techniques don't 
translate very well sometimes. Some of it does, some of it doesn't. Um, you have to kind of ground truth everything. Um, on the um, thinking about the future, um, I think some of these cool genomic tools that we spend a whole lot of money on are really interesting, and they're bringing forward a lot of traits of interest, new varieties that will be there. But if we don't have good seed systems, and this is where some of you people that work on practical things here, um, most of the places where we've been working, they've been releasing varieties over time, and we're still growing varieties that are 40 and 50 years old. In most every country that I work, that's the case. And it has to do with the, how the difficulty of scaling and working in seed systems. So there's the, probably the single biggest gain is to get good varieties that are locally appropriate. But in order to do that, we need kind of a, a push. And sometimes this might be some place where if people are working on peanuts in your countries, that could be a big help. Um, I think this is something that even when I uh, started learning more about how the U.S. system came to be on extension, that these, um, you know, the system is more important than any single thing. You can't, it's not, uh, you know, like I said, urea on a hybrid. You can't, none of those things seem to work particularly for peanuts. There's no silver bullets, but there's a lot of interesting systems work. One of them I wanted to point out is, is called doubled up legumes. And the example with peanuts, this picture is actually in Haiti. This is an indigenous practice that I saw in Northeast Haiti where they intercrop peanuts and pigeon peas. So you've got a, two legumes at once. But there's solid evidence from East Africa in particular where they're doing this in an intensified way. And because you're getting both crops, you get different climates or different areas where you're exploiting, you know, with the, the, the pigeon peas above, it's hard to see that picture, I'm sorry, but, and, and deep roots, you can harvest the peanuts with zero yield loss to the peanuts or to the pigeon peas. And so growing them together seems to be quite, quite an interesting uh, a possibility. And then it turns out that all that excess nutrient-rich biomass that's grown by the two of them yields to increases on the following rotation crop. So that's a, a, like the shrub system in the Sahel, I think there's, there's some innovative things that are pretty low input out there that we, we need to keep exploring. Again, the, the seed systems, you know, knowing where to get good quality uh, foundation seed, certified seed, it really doesn't exist almost anywhere that we work. Um, and that's something that we're working on, and there's been a lot of projects, but again, that those multiplication rates and the, the problems with the uh, quality of germination that comes from peanut make it, make it difficult. Um, with input packages, the key word being packages, it seems like you kind of have to put these things together, which from a science perspective makes it really hard to figure out what to prioritize, how to evaluate it from a return on investment standpoint. But I was re learning about, um, there's a very famous extension guy in the peanut world named Frank McGill. He's still around. He's like almost 100 years old and goes out and talks to people. And back in the 50s, he talked about growing peanuts as a package in Georgia. And they went from about what we are in as global average, about 1,000 pounds an acre, to what we have now. And it started because they started to put all these technologies together into packages that farmers could figure out. Um, and that's where one of the things that we're working on as a lab is to put those together along with credit and potentially some crop insurance to reduce the risk. Mechanization. Um, I, I bring this up because it seems like it's a big hurdle for the second part of that comment. It's really difficult to make big gains with people growing a quarter of a hectare crops. Um, and this is a bigger conversation, but in a lot of cases, we're finding that we can do better science and, and, and get bigger gains and pull a lot of technology if we work with our champion farmers that might have two or three or four hectares. And when you get to that scale, the labor is just so much and so we need some mechanization technologies. And that's not to say that I don't want to work with those, those very subsistence level farmers, but to make scientific gains, to, make, to, to really learn and how to improve that value chain, we've just been hovering down at the, like, uh, stuck in that informal sector where we can't do any quality um, at that level. And so I think we need some better mechanization. And also, and I'll finish on this because I'm over time, but the, um, 
peanut foods and processed foods in Africa, there's so much urbanization happening. I really would like to see more processed foods, which I normally wouldn't say, but peanut, locally sourced uh, processed foods or you know, peanut butter. Um, people living in urban environments are a big market, and I'm hoping that people like our farmers can tap into that market instead of them bringing it from South Africa or the US. Um, and with that, I think I'm totally out of time, and I'll sign off, and we'll um, look forward to talking with people later at the uh, Meet the Speaker.